are here with Chris Hinshaw, who I've probably known for almost a year, not quite a year yet. Um, but he is very involved with CrossFit now, helping a lot of CrossFit athletes at the games, uh, getting here and, and this weekend. And so we're just going to sit down and chat a little bit about his experience and how he's helping so many athletes, whether in the CrossFit Games or just in general in the CrossFit community. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's an uh, unbelievable time that we're having this podcast. It is. It yep. is quite the setting here <laughs> at the CrossFit Games. Every event is exciting. Things are shifting all over the place. So yep. it'll be a fun weekend for the next couple of days. Yep, absolutely. So let's start out and just talk a little bit about your background um, as a triathlete first. And I mean, you're world-class triathlete. It was we're at second place in the world championships, correct? Right. So yeah, the world championships is the Ironman world championships in Kona, Hawaii. Okay. Happens every October. Mm -hmm. And then, and that was, all of this was happening while you were, ho what, what age were you when you were I was in my early twenties. Okay. So when I was going to school, so I went to Cal Poly at San Luis Obispo as a business finance major. Mm -hmm. And this was something that I did in, in between classes. <laughs> yeah. Just a little hobby. <laughs> yeah. It seems like, you know, for me, when everybody was doing their things, you know, the college thing, I was out riding my bike, you know, five hours a day. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, I eventually realized that I had to live by myself <laughs> because I was swayed by, you know, influences of, right. you know, those college kids. Yeah. I remember that, trying to go to the 6 a.m. class at my CrossFit affiliate in college, but my roommates were staying up too late, so. Yeah, and then you make hard. bad choices, and right. then the next thing you know, it's it's 1 o'clock in the morning, and then you have a whole day <laughs> of training again. And Yeah, for us, yeah. it was challenging because we would do a lot of traveling, so okay. usually I would end up leaving on a, on a Friday and going to an event, mm -hmm. racing on a Saturday, and then coming back again, and so... I really learned early on that, that having a set schedule and the value of that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I went and lived, you know, by myself because I just, it was the easiest way for me to hold, mm -hmm. you know, the things that I needed to do to be successful. Wow. And then did, how long were you continuing to compete at that level? I started in 1981 and ended in 1989. Okay. Wow. I went to... Uh, I did the world championships in the month of, I think it was September. And then four weeks later, I went to Hawaii uh, and competed and did another Ironman. So I did two in 30 days. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's but I mean, incredible. that's the thing is that back then, you know, it's funny now, I would never, ever, ever imagine doing that kind of race. And like, I can't even wrap my head around it. <laughs> but back then, I remember the conversations I would have and to myself, mm -hmm. I could do this seven days in a row. Wow. And it was just because that's how we trained. It wasn't like we had a lot of firepower, mm -hmm. but we could just do things for a long amount of time. Wow. So how many hours a day would you be training at that time? Some days were incredibly long um it was not uncommon to have 12 14 hour days uh, wow. in the summertime but we would we would swim 25,000 meters in the pool uh per week we would ride 350 occasionally it would be i mean i had a week in there that it was a thousand miles uh rode down the coast of california wow and then uh we would typically run 50 a week wow yeah so it was it was Actually, it's just so incredible <laughs> that you think about where my endurance world was and then calibrating it to the CrossFit athlete. Mm -hmm. And it took me some time to really like, okay. Make that transition. <laughs> right. We're going to run six miles per week and we're going to swim 1,600 meters per week. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. For you, that's like a warm up, right? <laughs> right. And the thing is, is that I have to inside not let that side out, right? Mm -hmm. that, that for them, you know, that's the proper balance. Right. Right. So I want to get more into coaching in a minute, but first I want to talk about your introduction to CrossFit. How did you find CrossFit and, you know, how did you get started with it? God, it's so incredible. You know, I ran into Annie the other day and... and Annie Sakamoto, correct? Annie Sakamoto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we were just in an outside venue and, and it's always interesting to me, the people who... I'm in contact with a lot of, and I'm fortunate to be in contact with a lot of elite CrossFit athletes and 
Annie goes back to the day um, when I was first introduced to CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I meet her, I get super anxious and butterflies <laughs> inside. And I always want to ask Annie, you know, I want to take a picture with you. I don't have, I mean, I <laughs> like, she is my, like, I'm, I'm really, she's my favorite. Right. And, and for, for those people listening who might not know, Annie is one of the original CrossFitters um, and was there since day one in Coach Glassman's gym and actually went on to compete in the games a few for several years. Yep. Um, just an amazing athlete, amazing. awesome person. Yeah, and an incredible ambassador to CrossFit and, and spreading the word. And mm -hmm. I was in my mid-40s when I met her. I was in a meeting over in the uh, city of Santa Cruz. Okay. And they were in the process of, of looking at different gym locations, so moving the original HQ location. Oh, wow. And Lauren Glassman was there, Greg Robinson was there, and Annie Sakamoto was there. And it was Annie that kind of struck up, you know, a level of interest in mm -hmm. just my past and I was confiding in her about just the condition that my body was in from all the volume that I had done back in the triathlon days. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, we're fast forward 20 years. Okay. But by this time, you know, that volume had stacked up on itself and I was really struggling to, you know, get down stairwells and just be functional. And, and were you still continuing to run or ride your bike no. or swim? Not no, no, at no, all. no, no, no. So uh, you have to understand. So I was incredibly fit. Mm-hmm. But it would take me 10 miles to not just be so incredibly crippled on a run. Wow. So every movement was just so just if something like, for example, when I'd get up in the morning, the bottom of my feet would hurt for 20 minutes. Wow. Just getting out of bed. And so that's why I left the sport. I actually mm -hmm. got second in the world championships in 1989. And I did one more race and then quit. Wow. Yeah. Because I couldn't just, do it anymore. It was just too much. Wow. Right. So she told me that that day when we met she says you know I know and she was so nice to me she says I know you've done a lot of volume in your day but you know it's been all with the same muscle groups and and maybe if you you know worked on those neglected muscle groups you could become functional hmm. and I remember that I mean that was seven years ago mm -hmm. seven and a half years ago and I remember it was like yesterday because the word functional resonated so deeply with it's just like that's all I want Right. Matter of fact, my goal today, people ask, it's like, gosh, you want to go back to Ironman? You can do so many amazing <laughs> things now. It's like, I just want to be functional. <laughs> so Thank you. That's yeah. So <laughs> she talked me, you know, told me about it. And, and I went to the original Glassman space mm -hmm. uh, where they were at that time. And and I, I watched the people do workouts in there. And I had never picked up a barbell before. And it was really intimidating for me. Oh, yeah. And in the endurance world, you don't want to do a lot of heavy, heavy lifting because of the potential risk of converting fast twitch fibers. I mean, mm -hmm. slow twitch fibers into fast twitch fibers. Mm -hmm. You wanted to stay in that slow twitch domain and maximize that. And that was the belief. And it's kind of the same thing that weightlifting has, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to, you know, do any running because there's right. a potential risk. So for me, I was so intimidated that day. I knew I couldn't do a pull up and they were doing pull ups and they were bouncing barbells around and I didn't have the courage to walk in the gym did that day. Mm -hmm. And so I left and uh, it was sometime after that, uh, that I went back and, and uh, made myself do it. It was a, that was a rough time for me because, you know, as a, an elite athlete, you remember what you once were and you still think that is. And then all of a sudden some test comes along and mm -hmm. you're not that person anymore. And I realized, you know, here I was 45 years old and, and I didn't even know who I was and the wow. athlete. And, and I made myself go back to the gym and I've been going back ever since. And, and I'm shocked at what I can do now That's because amazing. of CrossFit. Yeah. Yeah. It blows me away. And, uh, I, I, there's so many people who I think can relate with you, not necessarily coming from being an elite athlete first, but just being so intimidated to walk into a CrossFit gym yep. for the first time who's, yep. who've never lifted a barbell or never done a pull up. So what, what do you think was it that got you to go back that second time? I wanted to become healthy. Mm -hmm. I really did. I think that for me, health was the number one thing that drove me that day. She told me, I mean, it like, it's hard for me. Like, I mean, yeah. That word functional really resonated with me. I, I, the space that I was in, the space that I held for myself was, was it was uncomfortable. And sh for me, t 
to restore my health. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, you know, you know my personality. I am not intimidated and I'm not as surprised. And I was very intimidated that day. Mm -hmm. And there was no way I was going to go in that gym. Mm -hmm. And uh, for all what I have done, yeah, I couldn't even make myself walk in the door. Wow. Well, I'm yeah. glad you went back. <laughs> I'm very glad you went back. And Thank now, <laughs> now do you, does it take you a long time to warm up, or how has it changed your day-to-day -day life? No, it's shocking. I have. I. It's the strangest thing because I don't, and I'm lucky. I don't have knee pain. I don't really. Have, I don't have mm -hmm. hip pain. My ankles are good. All my joints feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel balanced again. One of the things that was really difficult back in that day was. I felt out of balance. Like the left side was, I wasn't in sync and okay. it was hard to control and make things move properly. And mm -hmm. now I feel super youthful and like I run. <laughs> you without, run a lot with all of us. Right. Without, <laughs> without any pain. And yeah. Yeah. So I mean, what seems like a lot to us, I'm, I'm sure it's not a lot to you. Well, I mean, for me, <laughs> if you call me up and you're in town and you're like, Hey, you know, Chris, I was thinking maybe we could go to the track <laughs> and I'm never going to say no. Like no. how great is it? Right. And then if, if, you know, Alessandra Pacelli, you know, she's like, hey, I'm driving through. Can you, you know, maybe? And it's like, <laughs> of course. And so, yeah, it's not uncommon for me to do three running workouts in the same day. Yeah. Because it's the thing that for me to be able to spend time and, and, and you know, understand what endurance can do within the CrossFit community. Mm -hmm. It's a great space for me to learn. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you, do you ever bring it back the other way and t talk to anyone in the endurance community or advise anyone differently about their endurance training now that you understand CrossFit? I do. I talk about it a lot. And, and uh, the problem is, is there's this reluctance in that community. Mm. It's a very traditional community and right. um, their acceptance of, of lifting heavy and, and looking at development of all of their muscle fibers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the one thing that I really regret is I never picked up a barbell I have a certain percentage of fast twitch fibers, and I neglected them. Mm -hmm. I had no finishing kick. I had no ability of, of doing anything other than, you know, going long. Right. And I see the same thing, you know, on the weightlifting side. I think that CrossFit's changing a lot of that, and certainly the work that I'm doing within the community is showing that mm -hmm. running isn't going to impact your max lift. Matter of fact, no. we're finding it's making people stronger. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so I really wish that for me the endurance community and I'm not talking about going into CrossFit and having them do you know five days a week mm -hmm. but certainly a small dosage of it um, I think they would be shocked at the level of improvement that they'd have right just to provide a little more balance and yep support wow yeah um, then as far as training athletes in CrossFit how how have you approached that bringing your endurance training into CrossFit and how do you feel that it helps to round out the athletes or fill some hole that they might have had. So for me, what I, I, I really have started to notice, and, and I've noticed for a while now, is that when you go to, you know, different gyms, mm -hmm. the programming that they provide is, it's a lot of times it's catering to the members of that gym. Okay. And there's a lot of pressure within those members on the types of workouts that they like to have. Mm -hmm. No one wants to show up to the gym and do a 5K. Right. They won't. I mean, I, I, you rarely see those at affiliates nowadays. Right. Because it's just not fun to program, right? Right. And and so people, like, especially if I'm traveling and if I see the workout and it's like a 5K, I'm not going to go to that gym. <laughs> I'll go to a different one <laughs> because I'm at fallen in the same boat. Right. And what's happened because of that is that everybody just doing pure high intensity, you know, grip and rip type of workouts mm -hmm. have neglected their oxidative pathway. Okay. And what's interesting is that, you know, Coach Glassman, when, when I spoke to him about just my programming methodology, mm -hmm. it's identical to what he did back in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was very well balanced. He understood the importance of the oxidative pathway. The programming that he did was, you know, equally parted on, you know, that glycolytic pathway and the oxidative pathway. Mm -hmm. We all know that the 5K is the number one program workout on the main site. Right. That wasn't by accident. Mm -hmm. And... For me, when, when I got involved in, in coaching, I really looked at the, the imbalance between the way in which people were training. Mm -hmm. And I just had them focus on more oxidative work. I think the key, though, for me is, is really doing a good assessment of the athlete. Like you, you mm -hmm. fall into 
a category where you need to have more speed in your diet. Right. Uh, there's many athletes. Matter of fact, the vast majority within CrossFit need more endurance in their diet. Mm -hmm. And I have learned, you know, the uh, fast way and an effective way to assess an athlete mm -hmm. to where they should be spending their time. Right. And for me, that was one thing that I had always thought, okay, I'm pretty good at the longer events. I don't really uh, need a specialized coach for endurance, you're right? Really good. And so <laughs> I, I I actually didn't try to go seek you out, but we ended up meeting through a camp and hearing about your approach and how you do first make that assessment of an athlete and understand, okay, what does this athlete need? And then your programming is tailored towards that, I think is very beneficial. So even though I'm already pretty good at endurance, we could still work on, for me, those speed aspects. You're so <laughs> modest. <laughs> so the story actually is. <laughs> He's going to talk about my VO2 now. <laughs> the story is, is that, it, I mean, when we met, I remember that as just plain, we were at dinner and <laughs> I was just asking you questions. And it's always interesting to me of, of the level of honesty with certain mm. athletes and, and what they're willing to share. And, mm -hmm. and I, I typically will ask about mile time and 400 time. And what I'd look at is the relationship between those two times. Because mm -hmm. one's more of an anaerobic effort and one's more of an aerobic effort. And you knew your mile time, which is a surprise because most CrossFit athletes don't have any idea what their mile time is. Right. But then you told me what your 400 meter time was, right? And so, you know, you were in that 610, 615 range for your, your, your mile in 610. And, mm -hmm. and the, but then you told me you had a 72 second 400 time. <laughs> and I told you, I'm like, that's impossible. <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> and then you told me you ran the 200 in high school. And I'm like, there is no way. <laughs> There's no way. And, and so I like that, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's very rare when you come into a situation when you're coaching somebody that they know the aerobic side. They know that mile time. Mm -hmm. Everybody in CrossFit typically knows their 400. Matter of fact, most people on the elite level have a great 400 time. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you are an opportunity of like, wow, I can really experiment on Julie Fouché. <laughs> and that's what we did. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> we had a lot of fun and we made really good progress. I think for me, looking back at this year, I've been doing a lot of reflecting now that it, my season is over and there's a few milestones that I hit that I know I, I said, okay, I can be done competing. I can be happy with this. A couple of them, my clean and jerk was one. I wanted to get 220, which is 100 kilograms for me. That was my lifetime goal. Got that one. There was another workout, a barbell complex workout that I did that I, I met my goal. And then my 400 meter time, which we did when we were in Cookville and you coached me through it. And I don't think I ever would have done that if I was on my own. So Yeah, that was an incredible day. Remember, we actually... You ran 5,000 meters beforehand with we Camille. Did. We did. <laughs> then you looked really good. And I felt good that day, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that I love coaching is like running. I can really see an athlete, and I was able to see that day that, that you had something special going on. And, yeah, to be able to have an athlete that's willing to do that after 5,000 meters of running and then do mm -hmm. a 400-meter for time is a rare thing. And... Uh, yeah, I think that the way that we attacked that was, was good. I mean, the, so the, the story on that is that I told, you know, Julie, I said, I know your PR is 72 seconds, mm -hmm. but I really think that you can go sub 65. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to do that, though, unless you cross through the 300 in under 50 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I remember the look on your face. You're <laughs> like, but wait a minute. If I come Trying through to do the math. <laughs> you're like, if I come through in 51, I could hit the 66 and still get a six-second I don't understand. <laughs> I knew I was going to do it. I knew that it was happening. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, you, you took off so fast. I, I, the whole time I'm running down the field next to you, I'm like, you've got to slow down. You've got to slow down. I mean, who kills it? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. No, that was but incredible. It was it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, to hit uh, an eight-second PR after 5,000 meters, and, and that was a, a, a grueling week of training for you, mm -hmm. was, was remarkable. That was one of my – and I think that was leading into the week where it was right after the Open. That was probably one of my most difficult weeks of training. Yeah, you were doing year. like seven a day. Mm -hmm. It was intense. Definitely. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I that's why for me – you know, the regionals and, and your Achilles, I mean, it really, for what you had done, you know, and, and the thing is, is like, I, I'm, I, I'm in a good position where I'm able to see a lot of actual data, you know, mm -hmm. laboratory data. You see a and, lot of data. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and your numbers, you know, like your and, you know, I openly now talk about it because mm -hmm. it's something that is so incredible to me, especially coming from the endurance world to see numbers like you have your VO2 max 
how amazingly high that is, and then your percentage of, of lactate threshold relative to that VO2 mm -hmm. max, to think that your maximum sustainable pace is 95% of your all-out maximum effort is mind-blowing. And to think that, that you have that ability and then you fixed your speed side, mm -hmm. it was a combination that is not here at the games. <laughs> Well, it would have been interesting, but it is, it was interesting for me to do some of that more laboratory, get some of those laboratory numbers like the VO2 and see how they really are very consistent with my performance. We knew going in, I can usually stay at a pretty high pace for a long time. I'm good at those longer workouts and I can usually, even if you take it into the lifting side of things, I can sustain pretty close to my max load for a number of reps. Yeah. Um, but it's the max load that I'm always trying to push up to be able to compete with the other girls. So Yeah. I think that the thing that I learned about, about you and, and that we were very honest about, I mean, that first message that you had sent to me about when I asked you to do a 400 for time mm -hmm. and you weren't able to finish that on the first pass. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, is that coaching a lot of people, I see that a lot and mm -hmm. it's not an uncommon thing. Most people don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you, you go out and I ask, you know, to do something very challenging and sometimes it's just like, you know what? I can't do it. I can't wrap my hand around. It. Mm -hmm. I can't make that happen. And I thought that for me, that was an opportunity to really address that side mm -hmm. and we can call it a weakness or whatever but we we needed to address that mm -hmm. right because there's going to be situations that you're going to have to do that yeah. on the stage mm -hmm. and i think that that we put some good programming together to address that absolutely yeah and I, then being able to overcome it was that was a huge boost of confidence and just to know that I could overcome that, have such a huge PR, and going into regionals, it was, I felt really great, so. Yeah, I mean, that's, for me as a coach, it was mm -hmm. very healthy because you identify someone if they need more speed, like you did, or you need more endurance, like Rich Froning does, but then there's the other aspect of it, and that is that emotional, mental side, mm -hmm. and as a coach, you really have to address programming yeah. to fix that as well, and I think that like that gave us a really good mm -hmm. window to kind of like, let's try and figure right. this thing out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, cool. I always talk about, you know, you, you mm -hmm. are incredibly coachable. You provide great feedback. And I think that at the end of the day, if, if an athlete doesn't provide that and they're mm -hmm. not honest about their issues that they're having with a workout, a coach can't do anything. Right. Right. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the unique things about you too. I mean, you coach so many athletes at a high level, but it's rare to find a coach who is not only, especially in CrossFit, who's not only good at programming and being able to say, okay, this is what we need to do in order to make the improvements, but also to understand that mental emotional side, know when to push, when not to push. And then the, the in-person coaching, like knowing, okay, they look really fresh. Let's go for a 400 time yeah. trial or when to pull it back. Um, and you know what to say to help, an athlete with that mental emotional side either in training or in competition so that's one of the things I've been most impressed with you about oh, is you. that you have all of those different aspects of a coach and it's very I think it's very rare especially in CrossFit because there's so it's such a complex sport there's so many things going on I think thank you very much <laughs> I mean that means a lot <laughs> I, I think that that specialists and in, in this space that I specialize in mm -hmm. um I think it makes it easy. For example, you know, I love programming. Mm -hmm. I love programming workouts and they come easy because I do it all the time. Um, I think that, that being able to work with so many people, it broadens that, right? So, I mm -hmm. mean, I have five minute milers and I have Steph the Hammer just, she ran 59 minutes and 30 seconds for her mile oh, yesterday. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, I have a broad range and I think for me I, that, that programming side is important, but nothing beats for me than running side by side with someone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm able to hear their footstep. I'm able to hear their breathing. I'm able to see their posture. And mm -hmm. that to me is the best. And I think that's what makes remote programming so difficult right. is that you want to be able to see the person and hear them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you, how do you approach it? How do you manage it with so many athletes that are asking for your advice and then Obviously, you want to be there in person as much as possible, but how do you 
what's your framework for how you how you manage yeah balancing my time has been um somewhat challenging mm -hmm. uh for me, what I'm really interested in doing is, is following what Coach Glassman did. I really respect that he came up with the new fitness methodology. He had some really good success, like you said, with Annie and Nicole mm -hmm. and, and that initial core of people. Mm -hmm. And he felt like, you know what, I, I need to compress the time to validate this. And so what did right. he do? He put them up on .com, mm -hmm. and those workouts became available for free for everybody. Mm -hmm. And people came to him and mm -hmm. within a very short amount of time he didn't need to do any you know laboratory testing he didn't r need to do any studies or analysis he right. knew based upon the numbers of people and so I really followed that same thing and a lot of people think that you know I charge these athletes mm -hmm. to coach them I don't I do it all for free which is crazy to me <laughs> so I, yeah I think that there's 60 people here mm -hmm. that are at the games that I do it all for free and a lot of it is it, the sole purpose is what Coach Glassman did, and that mm -hmm. is I'm trying to find a better way. Mm -hmm. And the things that we're finding out is remarkable. That that normally if you had one athlete, it would be an anomaly. So, right. like I know that the correct type of running will increase your strength. Mm -hmm. If I saw that only with one athlete, it would just be an anomaly, and I wouldn't notice it. Mm -hmm. But taking on like a Rich Froning was incredibly risky in the sense that. I knew I could make him a better runner, right. but what if I made his lifts go down? What if I made him a worse crossfitter? Mm. Is that a better athlete? Well, it's not. Right. And so for me, when, when I had a chance to work with him and, and then you take like a Matt Frazier, you know, he ran 5,400 meters on the track. And then three hours later, he went to the gym and did a lifetime clean PR at 385. Wow. And here's a guy that... You know, his dorm room was 100 yards from the gym because he didn't want to walk very <laughs> far between workouts. And That's so, incredible. Yeah, so to have a large sample size has really, really helped mm -hmm. understand how to properly coach endurance mm -hmm. to the everyday athlete, you know, the person who's really right. looking for fitness to be functional. Mm -hmm. So how can that everyday athlete take advantage of your programming now? Yeah, I know you have. I've been to your seminar, which is excellent. Oh, but, thank you. And you also have some online programming, right? I do. So I, I, I share. So one of the things that for my seminar, uh, it's aerobiccapacity.com, mm -hmm. and I really teach people about the engine. Okay. Um, I share everything. There is not one piece of information that I hold back. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that when I was putting together the seminar, Matt Chan told me, he says, you know what? You got to let it all out there, mm -hmm. everything. So the way in which I assess athletes uh you can come there and you can make an assessment of yourself you can make an assessment of anybody of where you need you know speed in your diet where you need endurance mm -hmm. and those seminars i explain exactly how i have trained everybody mm -hmm. whether you're rich froning i share here's the model this mm -hmm. is exactly what i do um, but also i've learned that people they don't always want to have you know themselves to figure it out right they want it just tell me what to do. I it's understand. It's easier that way sometimes. Right. So I, I have one online programming uh, that is the exact same methodology that I do today. Because okay. of the numbers of people that I work with, I was able to create a, an algorithm that allows me to take prior performances mm -hmm. and then personalize their pacing. Okay. That's really the key. I mean, to the endurance side of the equation, your workouts, like what I would mm -hmm. give you, Every single thing has a target time. Mm -hmm. Everything, no matter what you do, every rest is specified. Because CrossFit athletes, they have a tendency to want to hit the gas, right? <laughs> yes, they want to go hard. <laughs> and the problem with that is, is that you're not getting the correct stimulus. And so what we do is we give target times for everything, and then you're going to actually maximize your adaptation. Mm -hmm. It is always, I can say it's always fun to do your workouts, to be able to watch on, your, you know, take a look at your watch and know you're exactly where you need to be. It's kind of a, like a breath of fresh air from our normal, you know, just gas pedal to the metal. So. Well, that's what people like, though. It's like, <laughs> it wasn't that bad. I mean, it was right, kind of. Right. Like, I could do this. It's okay. Right. And Builds so you your confidence. Yeah. Right. You walk away and it's like, oh, wow. Right. That, yeah. And I think that that's what at the end of it all is like, it is about confidence that mm -hmm. if you're going in and wrecking yourself, it's like, one, I don't want to go back and do it. And two, it's like, what am I learning today? Mm -hmm. And part of what I want 
everybody that I work with is I want you to become knowledgeable. I want you to recognize that of all the workouts that I gave you today, you understand why I gave it and you understand that this is the highest and best use of your time. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that when they come to my seminar, they know that when they go out and do an endurance workout, that it is about their time and, and really maximize them the gain. And I, that's why, you know, the people that, that do follow the programming, mm -hmm. the performance that comes their way is significant because it really is all about efficiency. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I've definitely enjoyed doing it. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I want to close with three questions. Um, so and these are just generally about health. So the first one, three things that you do on a regular basis that you think have the po most positive impact on your health. I brush my teeth twice a day at okay. a minimum. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I haven't heard that one yet, <laughs> but very important. <laughs> um, I go to sleep usually before nine o'clock. Okay. Uh, and are you an early riser then? I am. Okay. So sleep I've, I've learned is, is for me the most important thing. Um, and then in terms of my health, I, I really try and eliminate stress. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where for me being, so I'm 52 years old. For me to take and do more moderate intensity types of workouts, mm -hmm. like the ones I program, are something very cathartic for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that removal of that stress is, has really created the biggest bang for me. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That's great. How about one thing that you think might have a big impact on your health, but you're just not good at implementing it yet in your life? Okay. <laughs> so in the sport of triathlons and in endurance, mm -hmm. their carbohydrate is very important. Mm -hmm. And in a pinch, uh, if you're on a long bike ride, if you, you know, you're suffering somewhere in a race, right. you go for the sugary sugar. And I am a huge fan of, of candy bars, oh, Snicker yeah. bars. <laughs> I love sodas. Uh, I mean, in terms of when I'm competing. Right. And so for me, like when someone asks me, you know, what's my favorite food? It's a soda, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because of the history and the right. things that it brought me. And it's just, it's a, like a comfort a thing comfort from back. Thing. And it's a rare thing, but it's something that I wish that I had the ability of removing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then final question is, what does a healthy life look like to you? For me, it's a, it really is about leading a positive life and, mm -hmm. and being a good role model to others. I, I really genuinely in my heart, I, I contribute to this community because of what it gave me. Mm -hmm. um, I am really genuinely to my core grateful for having my health back. Mm -hmm. um, and that conversation with Annie and, and what Coach Glassman did of just making this available, I'm grateful. And I have learned, you know, by paying it forward, the lives that I've been able to affect and improved has enriched me beyond any level I could ever even imagine. And so I think that that integrity and, and going in with no expectation for anything coming back to you, mm -hmm. it's really just, you know what, I'm grateful and I want to contribute that I think has been the most fulfilling thing that in my life I've ever done. Wow. Well, yeah. I'm very grateful that you found CrossFit and that you've helped me as well and that you're helping so many people now too. So thank you. Julie. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you for sitting down to chat sure. with us. That's thank you. Chris Hinshaw.